In this section, we'll discuss rotation of a body about a fixed axis. Consider the simple case of a point particle having mass m fixed in the xy plane, so it lies in the xy plane. Let's imagine that it has a, an angular velocity vector, which looks like this. So it's, a velo it's an angular uh, velocity vector which points parallel to the z-axis and has magnitude omega. We can calculate, you may recall, the resulting linear velocity vector by taking the cross product of the velocity vector with the position vector for our particle. So here's r, the position vector. And so when we cross omega into r, we get a velocity vector which points inward along the negative x-axis. And you can show that for this uh, angular velocity vector, this point particle will execute circular motion in the xy plane, just like this, by taking the cross product omega crossed into r for each point along its trajectory. So we might answer the simple question, what is the angular momentum for this particle? Recall that angular momentum is r crossed into the momentum vector. And the momentum vector is m times the velocity vector. And so for our angular momentum vector here, we get r crossed into m times omega crossed into r. In other words, the angular momentum of this particle is m times r crossed into omega crossed into r. Which direction does that point? Well, when the particle sits at this point here, that vector omega crossed into r, we already know that that gives us a velocity vector which points along the negative x direction. And so if we cross our r vector at that point with our v vector at that point, we find that l points along the z axis. So L is going to be m r squared omega times z hat at that point. When the point particle executes circular motion, it comes around to the other side. Say it's over here. My position vector now is that vector. And you'll find that if you take the cross product between r and omega in this way, you get exactly the same angular momentum. So omega crossed into r is going to give us a v-vector, which looks like that. And when I cross r into that v-vector, I'll get exactly the same angular momentum. And so for a particle trapped in the xy plane uh, with a uh, rotation vector pointing along the z direction, the angular momentum looks just like this. It's a constant with this magnitude and points along the z-hat direction. But what if my particle were not trapped in the xy plane? How would the angular momentum vector look different? Now, let's take our particle um, lying some distance above the xy plane, some fixed distance, and its position vector r now has a z component. So it no longer just has a component along x and y, it has also a z component. Let's first calculate the velocity vector. And you can see here, what we're going to get is omega z hat crossed into r. And in this case, we'll get a velocity vector, which still points inward along the negative x-axis. So the velocity vector will look like this at that point in its uh, motion, omega r times negative x hat. And if you do the, cu the cross product all along the trajectory, again you can find that for this velocity, for this angular velocity vector, our point particle will execute circular motion about the z axis. Now we want to ask the question, what does the angular momentum vector look like? 
say let's write out what it looks what the expression is call that it's r crossed into p so that's going to give me r crossed into m v and again we get m times the cross product of r with omega crossed into r again well by the definition of the right hand rule and the cross product we know that the angular momentum vector has to point at a right angle to both r and the velocity vector and so when the point is at when the particle is at this point the angular momentum vector points in what direction it has to point at a right angle to both r and v and so it actually points like this But what happens when the particle is on the other side of its orbit? Let's say it's over here now. Now in this case, its position vector is given by that. So there's r at the new point, and the angular, the, the uh, velocity vector v now points out of the page, like that. Well, this cross product still has to apply when you calculate the angular momentum vector. And so the angular momentum vector still has to point at a right angle to r and v. And so that means at that point in its orbit, the particle has an angular momentum vector which now points in this direction. And so this is strange. The angular momentum vector does not remain a constant for this particle, even though uh, its motion looks to be pretty simple. So that means that the angular momentum vector is not a constant. In other words, its dot product is not zero. And this turns out to be important. This is because the angular momentum vector no longer points parallel to the z-axis in the way that it did in the last problem. As it turns out, the products of inertia, that tensor that we'll talk about, has off-diagonal elements. And so that means that the angular momentum vector has components along the x and the y directions because the particle is no longer trapped in the xy plane. Let's make all of this a little bit more rigorous. If we write our angular momentum, excuse me, our angular velocity vector, it looks like this, it only has a z component. Our position vector for a particle that's not trapped in the xy plane looks like this, it has an x, y, and z component. And so when we calculate our velocity vector, remember it's omega crossed into r, it looks like this. So the velocity vector has an x component, which is proportional to the y displacement from the origin, and a y component, which is proportional to the x displacement from the origin. Now if we want to calculate our angular momentum vector, it's going to be the cross product, remember, of r with the momentum vector, which turns out to be this cross product here. And so this is going to be m times the cross product from these two vectors, x, y, and z, crossed into minus omega y plus omega x and 0. And so this is going to be equal to m times minus omega x z and then minus omega y times z and then finally the very last term is going to be omega times x squared plus y squared so now we can immediately see why the angular momentum vector changes with time because the x and y components depend on x and y so even if the particle is at a fixed z height x and y are changing as the particle revolves around the z-axis and so the x and y components of the angular momentum vector have to change with time the z component that one doesn't change as long as the particle is at a fixed radial distance from the z-axis and so x squared plus y squared, that's the radial distance from the z-axis. And as long as the, uh, 
the particle is at a fixed distance from that rotation axis, the z component will change, but the x and the y components will change for the angular momentum vector. This remote result may seem a little surprising. You're probably used to thinking about a case where the angular momentum vector is parallel to the angular velocity vector. This is what you were taught uh, in your intro physics classes, but this is not true in general. And you can see that in this case, we have an angular momentum vector that has an x, a y, and a z component, even though our angular velocity vector only has a z component. Moreover, you might be a little surprised to see that even though you have a constant angular velocity vector, the angular momentum vector is not a constant. Why is that? Well, for our mass suspended above the xy plane, it's executing this circular motion. Of course, there's some sort of centrifugal tendency for the particle. And so in order to force it to con con uh, keep in this circular motion, you have to exert a centripetal force. And recall that the torque from a force is given as r crossed into f. Well, here's our r vector, and you can see that if I crossed r into f, I'm going to get a non-zero torque vector. In fact, in this case, r crossed into f is going to give me a torque vector, which points like this. In other words, the angular momentum vector, which looks like this, is going to change going into the x direction. And that's exactly what we see. This is in contrast to the case when the particle is trapped in the xy plane. So it's, this particle is exerting, uh, exhibiting circular motion in the xy plane. And in order for that to happen, there has to be a centripetal force accelerating it toward the y-axis. But in this case, the centripetal force vector is parallel to the radius vector, and therefore the cross product between them is exactly zero, meaning that there, is, there are no torques acting in this system. And so this is one example of the sort of uh, counterintuitive results you get when you start thinking about more complicated rotations uh, in your intro physics classes, you usually took very simple kinds of rotations, and I give you the very simple result that the angular momentum vector uh, was parallel to the angular velocity vector, but that is not true in general. We can extend this result to think about the angular momentum vector for an extended body. So here, of course, the body is made up of, of many individual particles, alpha, and we might locate the positions of each of those particles with a vector r alpha. Of course, the total angular momentum for the system, excuse me, the angular momentum for each individual particle is going to be this. And so that's going to be this. Uh, and then the, the total angular momentum for the system is just going to be the sum over all those particles of these uh, individual angular momentum vectors. This gives rise to the moment of inertia tensor that we'll explore in more detail uh, in the next section. But to introduce it briefly, again, this is our angular momentum vector for the system as a whole, um, and then we can write each component of the angular momentum vector, say the z component. It turns out that this is going to be equal to that same sum over alpha, mass of particle alpha, times the radial, excuse me, times the, the distance of particle alpha from the z-axis, squared, but the x component, the x component, we worked out to be this. Recall for a single particle, it's this.
So it involves the product of the x position of, of particle alpha and the z position of particle alpha times omega, something similar for y. And this portion of that sum, this turns out to be the moment of inertia tensor. And we'll see more about that uh, in the next section.